This is Richard Solomon. Good morning. This is Taking Care of Business, and this is part two of our interview with uh, rock guitarist extraordinaire Jeff Matson. So uh, we're going to continue with our uh, interview right here. So keep it locked in at 88.1 FM, WCWP, WCWP.org, TCBradio.com. All right, this is Richard Solomon, uh, TCBradio.com, 88.1 FM, and we are here continuing uh, our talk with Jeff Matson And in pre-production, because we actually do research on the show, you were, you were, we were talking about your connection to this, the CW Post campus. So, ah, so yes. why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because well, that's a great little piece of trivia. Well, the, the, uh, the Zen Tricksters grew out of a band, was it actually a change of a name, grew out of a band called uh, The Volunteers that started back in 1979. And that band was more in the process of morphing from a band called Lifestream. It's very complicated. <laughs> but so as they decided they were going to play Grateful Dead music, uh, they called me to, 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 join, well, to audition, basically. So my first time I ever played with them, what was to become years later, the Zen Tricksters, was uh, at, uh, in, in a big, like kind of a cafeteria with a big spoon painted down one side of it. Does that still exist here anywhere? Anyway, anyway, no, I, I just I read it and I got in. With, I got up and played with them. And that was the first time it was right here. But it was at, uh, at and Then we played at the. Was it called the Rathskeller back then? At the, in the Hillwood Commons. I don't know. So I went to Binghamton with Jeff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, which is, which is famous for other things. So, so you remember the spoon, but. Well, no, it was definitely here, and, and, and it, had, it was just painted on the wall, this big, giant spoon. I don't know, it made me think it was a, uh, you know, a dining like a coffee, room or something. Coffee place. I just yeah. think it's, like, memories are amazing because you can remember a spoon from 30 years ago, but you know, well, yeah. what happened for breakfast, you probably can't remember. Well, that. yeah, <laughs> if I had a big spoon. <laughs> if you had a big spoon, you could remember. <laughs> so so let's, let's go back a little bit in history. What, what were your first – I remember my first influences – um, I remember as a kid, I would actually have a little transistor radio. And my parents would say, go to bed. And I would actually put the uh, – uh, uh, Chris, Chris, who's our engineer, is probably like looking at this like, oh, my God, ancient history. But I would take the transistor radio, put it under my bed, and I actually listen to it and fall asleep to that. What yeah, when, and, you know, what, yeah what similar we, thing. What, listen to like WABC, yeah, so 77 like, WABC. Von Lundy and yeah. Dan Ingram and yeah. all those guys. Yeah, yeah Chuck absolutely. Leonard and Cousin Brucey. Yeah. I, in fact, sure. Cousin Brucey was a guest on this show. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so who did? So you listened to ABC? Yeah, that radio. was you know in the, in, in the uh, I guess late sixties, uh, and I uh, simultaneously started buying Beatle albums. I was into the Beatles. I mean, the, the, my earliest memory. Uh, of wanting to be a musician, aside from the fact that my dad was a musician, was seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. I know that's a real cliche, and so many people have said that over the years, but it's really true. I, uh, I was really young, too. I guess I was, what was that, 64, 63, 64? I was probably like five or six years old, but saw the Beatles on uh, Ed Sullivan. I thought, oh, how cool is that? I just knew that. I didn't know the word cool yet, but I knew that that was cool. <laughs> and I said, I, I want to do that. That looks like fun. What instrument did your dad play? My dad uh, was a bebop trumpet player in the, in the you know, 40s and 50s, and then, then he switched to keyboards, and he still, he's still out gigging. Wow. Amazing. Did you ever jam with him? Oh, yeah. Sure. That must be a very cool experience. Yeah. We've actually, uh, and, uh, that was the last time, I guess my 50th birthday party when we were playing and we got him up. On my wedding, too, he got up and played with us, yeah. That's yeah, got to be such fun. a feeling. So there you are, because I, I guess there's a lot of the same experiences kind of I had, because my parents, uh, who thank God are still around, when I was when the Beatles came to New York, I was part of the screaming crowd of people oh, with my parents. Oh. Now, of course, I was probably in a diaper, but <laughs> but I remember that because you know I'm 51, and uh, you know my parents. And I remember seeing them on. Oh, you're uh, still a kid. You know, on, uh, my grandmother's <laughs> house, watching them. You know, you guys are dating yourselves. I have no memory of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but let me ask you something that's so, somewhat lost because at least all three of us can relate to this. There were record stores. You would see records released. I remember the first 45 I ever purchased was Light My Fire by The Doors. Mm -hmm. My cousin said, oh, it's different than the album version. Uh, you know, there was yeah. like a B-side. I don't even know what the, I don't know if, the, if Crystal Ship was the B-side of that or not. But I remember you know, always going to Corvettes 
uh -huh, uh, yeah. in Douglaston and, and getting albums and looking at the artwork and, you know, and, and the lyric sheets. Uh, it was a day out. <laughs> it, it really, it, not only was it a day out, but, but you, you, you know, the funny thing is you'd play the record and you'd stare at the record. You'd be like, it was going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, there's a story, but that, that's somehow lost. You know, I mean, well, that whole, yeah, that whole I mean, experience of buying, you know, a concept album as opposed to a song. Yeah, well, I'm still buying albums, so I'm, I haven't moved into the uh, 21st century yet. I, I buy CDs, you know, and even that's a loss because, uh, you know, you have the nice big covers on the, on, on record record albums, you know, a lot more room for artwork and lyrics and yeah, fan pictures things, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Well, look, Pink Floyd in those days had posters as part of the album. Oh, remember? that was a real big thing uh, yeah. in the early 70s. Everybody put posters, free posters in with their records. It was like for a couple of years there. Yeah, I think even Fleetwood Mac may have done something like that, I think, yeah. in like rumors. Yeah, I had, like that. I had the, well, the Beatles did it with the White Album. They had the poster and then they had the four pictures of the head, the headshots. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember my friend when Terrapin Station came out, he got a copy of it. We ran home from school and we put on the second side with the London Symphony. Yeah. And we thought we took the wrong album. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't quite get it, and the first side was very slick for those days. For the great well, that, that album was yeah. pretty slick in general because yeah. they used an outside producer. Yeah. Yeah. Other than the Beatles, who who did you buy as a kid? Who, what albums well, did you buy? Well, after that, it was sort of uh, I, I was already attracted like the jamming thing, so I was really I I dug uh, Cream and Hendrix, uh, Doors. Um, Santana, things like that, and then uh, and the next step after that was like the band, uh, the band, and the Allman Brothers, and, and the Dead, and and then uh, you know I was well, and oh stuff like the Stones and the Who and stuff like that. But I, as soon as I got into the Dead and the Almonds and that kind of thing, I I kind of shut down on everything else for a lot of years. So I was just so engrossed in that music that, particularly the Dead, I didn't I needed to hear anything else for a long time. What did it for you? Was it the scene? Was it the themes? Was it the fact that they, they you know, they played like such great long tunes? You know, now nowadays if it's not you know under four minutes or something like that, it has no you know commercial success or whatever. What, uh, what was it? I think those days it was the same thing. I mean, it was well, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the first things that attracted me to the Dead was the song "Truckin'" uh, on American Beauty. And I loved the f the feel of it, you know that that shuffle that only the dead can do, and then those little nasty guitar licks Garcia was playing. I loved them, and I said, "Wow, when this, I'd love to hear them do some more of that with this song." And then Europe '72 came out, and it was like trucking, and then the whole side of the record is a jam. And I was like, you know, I got my wish, and, and that, it was like Christmas '72, I think that came out. Mm -hmm. And it was boy. a triple album. Yeah. Yeah, which is amazing and, uh, for its day that it was a six-sided, you know, record. Yeah, you know? and I just ate that. Well, I just bought the 73-disc version of Europe 72. <laughs> it's a, a steamer trunk with the entire tour in it. Right, I, I, I just saw that advertised on, uh, I think, uh, Dead.net or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So do you still listen to a lot of Grateful Dead music? Yeah, well, I mean, I listen to it professionally now a lot, oh, so right, I get to hear it quite a bit, like, cause we do shows, and we listen to the show that we're going to do that night. We don't listen to every single note of it, but we listen to uh, the day of the show to kind of get into the vibe of it. And, uh, so I'm, I'm still hearing quite a bit of Grateful Dead, but I have my tastes are all over the map. So, uh, so you know, when I get home from the road, uh, I'll sometimes <laughs> not listen to a lot of the Grateful Dead for a while. You know, just because there's so much other great stuff to listen to. You know. Do you listen to Dark Star Orchestra? Do you listen to yourself? A little bit. I, you know, just to sort of check out how I'm doing. But I, you know, you're your own worst critic, and it's, it's, you know, where Randy listens to it and enjoys it. And that's my wife, and and, uh, but I'm like, all right, turn these off, you know, because I hear every little mistake or unintended note that I play you know it's just, the it's goodness torture. is the fans don't know because of course as much as, as, much as I, I love the music I know nothing about music or notes or keys or scales so to me all that just sounds just perfect 
So if that's any consolation. You know. Oh, it is. It is. It, it, and even even if you know that stuff, you don't know what I was intending to play. And what came out might be fine. And might, you might even like it better than what I intended. But I hear it, and I hear my intent. And it's, so it's an only something, you know, even the other guys in the band won't even know what I intended to play or, so, or what I was shooting for vibe-wise or something like that. But I hear it, and I just if I failed... It's just, yeah, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you try to do the improv thing and oh yeah and and it, does it just like is it one of those things where it's sort of completely unplanned or it's just like completely unplanned? Oh, there without a net. There yes, is there it, are large. Well, I, mean, I never play a solo twice. I mean, in the same way twice, and then those those long segue sections between tunes or or or, or in the real jamming tunes like Dark Star. Or, or playing in the band, completely improvised. I mean, completely goes to different place every night, and it's uh, uh, all on the spur of the moment. Is it refreshing? That's the spirit of the music. Is it refreshing or is it scary or both? <laughs> you know, because uh, it's definitely refreshing because it keeps it fresh. It's, it's you know, if you have to play the same notes every night, I, I'd go. I'd last about three days. And I'd be done. I mean, I, I couldn't deal with that. Uh, I mean, it's all about the improvising, and scary. Mm, no, 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 I live for that. I mean, it goes to scary places sometimes, <laughs> so, uh, but that's that's living on the edge. I like that, too. Well, like, I know the song Dark Star has been recorded at, at so many different lengths over the years. Yeah, because it's basically two short little verses, and the, re- and the rest of it's all improvised. Exactly. You know, I know that, like, Jackie Gleason said that you can't rehearse comedy because then it wouldn't be funny. And the way you can't rehearse improv... So it has to just happen. Well, you, you know, know, you can rehearse in, in the sense that the more you do it, the more the better you get at doing it, you know, the more of a handle you have on it. But you can't rehearse what exactly the notes you're going to play because then it isn't imp- improvisation anymore. So is that why it's Dark Star Orchestra? It's you're playing Grateful Dead music, but you're not, you're not the Grateful Dead. You're not copying the Grateful Dead. Well, I think that when they named the band, they were, they were thinking in terms of how a, how a, like a symphony orchestra uh, plays this music that's, that's already been written years and years ago, and they keep it, f- they keep it in the repertoire for everybody to hear. So the Grateful Dead are gone, so, but you can c- still s- come see the way, uh, for example, the way the Grateful Dead played in 1972 on any given night, or 1987, or 1991, you know, on a, or 1969 for that matter, you know, on any given night, we're going to try to replicate that. So it's kind of like we're keeping all that in in uh, in, in the repertory of, of, of like as a symphony orchestra would play Bach and Beethoven. You know, nobody says to them, "Oh, you played that stuff before." You know, don't don't play that crap. No, write some new songs. <laughs> you know, I, I always felt grateful that music was almost like a public trust, and uh, you're the keepers of the trust for for you know keeping it alive for people to listen to and experience. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. So when you're not when you're not on the road, do you listen like like when you really want to just chill out? Do you just completely turn music off and just try to, you know, no, I, recharge? I, I, the only time the only time I don't want to listen to music is right after a show because you know I just had my brain rattle for four hours you know with loud music you know so, and even then, but like after about an hour, I'm laying in my bunk in the bus and I'll put my headphones on and I'll. Put something really zone zone something good to zone out to, you know. Is that is that like a moment where all of a sudden maybe you'll start writing some lyrics down or you'll write some? No, tunes? pretty much my brain is done by then. So when when is <laughs> when 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 is when for you is the time when some of that creative process? Kinda I have about there's about a, a, a window of about three or four hours <laughs> in my like from three about four hours between tours. <laughs> no, but from about like three thirty to about seven thirty at night when 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 I'm at. My, well, that's not true. As the night goes on, I'm not a morning person, so I can't get up and write in the morning unless I wake up with an idea in my head, and then I just pretty much just write it down and get to it, back to it later or something like that. But, but uh, it's just the way uh, my biology works. You know, I'm later in the day, better for me, and uh, I got to sit down and work at it. It's not like some of these guys, like Ryan Adams, who just 
you know, has to have a pen in his hand because he writes like 10 songs a day, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's crazy. I wish I had that kind of, you know, you know, just pulling it out of the air like constantly like Dylan used to be. So coming back to Donna Jean, when did you meet her and how did you meet her? Um, th- at the uh, 2005 uh, Gathering of the Vibes, this big festival uh, that's been going on since 96. I've played at every one of them. Which is, by the way, a lot, for the people listening, uh, you can catch a lot of that on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, well, that would have been the tenth year, tenth year that um, uh, since Jerry passed away, Jerry Garcia. So they wanted to do a big tribute to him. So um, they they had Dark Star Orchestra, and I wasn't in the band at the time. They had them as the house band. This is on the big Saturday night show, and then they brought in Donna Jean, David Nelson, Tom Constantin. Martin Fierro, Melvin Seals, the the two girl singers from the Garcia band, uh, Peter Rowan, uh, and a bunch of other people. But all these people who had played with Jerry, and they, and I offered to, you know, I had this relationship with them. I played all the Gathering Lives. I offered to organize it uh, because it was going to be a huge production. So I was the uh, go-to guy for who's going to sing what, when, and drew up the show and everything like that. So I got the, so I, I was the one who would call them all up and said, hey, this is Jeff Matson. I'm working with the Gathering of Eyes. What, what songs do you want to sing? And so I, I talked to, that was the first time I spoke to Donna Jean, and, and uh, she offered to also sing with the Zen Tricksters who were playing that way. That year. I said, great, love to have you. And then, so the day came when she was going to sit in and uh, she sat in for two songs, and and then we went backstage, and we hung out all day, uh, the Zen Tricksters and her and her husband David, and we just hit it off. And she loved the band, and I think in the back of our heads we were just thinking, oh, we could do something together. And I mean, I know I was thinking that, but I didn't realize she was thinking it. And then we did a big uh, Rex benefit at the uh, Center for Ethical Culture uh, off on Central Park West. And it was all the same kind of a deal. It was Donna Jean and Tom Costanton and, and David Nelson and a bunch of people um, with, the Zen, with the Zen Tricksters. And uh, so we worked out some of her original music for that that she had been written. And that worked out good. And so we started this uh, music relations. And now we're, we're best friends. And, and uh, you know, I, well, unfortunately, we don't play as much as we used to because I... I joined Dark Star Orchestra and it just eats up gigantic amounts of my time. But uh, we are doing some shows at the end of uh, uh, January. We're going to talk about that in a second. But one thing, I, just for people out there, there is a great video of you on the internet that's posted on your site uh, where it's you and another guitarist. I just don't remember who it was. And Donna are all singing just one acoustic song. It's just absolutely beautiful. I, I, I I, I saw it a while ago. It was just, I don't remember. It was just absolutely beautiful. The other thing, I might as well just say it here. I, I watch a lot of your stuff on uh, YouTube. I guess that's one great thing about the Internet. And you, you definitely sing with so much passion. You oh, really thank do. thank you. I mean, you really see it. And, you know, there are a lot of musicians out there who sing, but you really truly, truly have passion. Uh, you know, that's why I said if you ever need anybody to do I know you right, I'll, you know, me and Jeff <laughs> could go in the back. And <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I could listen. <laughs> we'll, we'll be backup singers. <laughs> <laughs> could listen with passion. <laughs> you know. But, yeah, you definitely have just immense passion in, in your you. vocals. I, and it, it definitely what, shows. That's what I like about singers. I'm more interested in their passion than their quality. Of their, I mean, I'd rather hear uh, Bob Dylan sing than – Celine Dion or something like that. You know, it's obviously got a great instrument, but, you know, when Bob Dylan says, you're an idiot, babe, you know, it's just like, <laughs> yes, you are an idiot. <laughs> you enjoy singing his songs, though. Bob Dylan's yes. songs? Oh, yeah. I, I, I heard you, Love a it. version of Tangled Up in Blue. Yeah, I've been uh, singing that one for a long uh, time. You did beautiful, beautiful Thank job. You. What, what uh, Dylan's songs do you like? What's Dylan's songs? Yeah, like, like, which ones don't I like? Uh, but, uh, oh, God. Uh, I don't even know where to start, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, Tang- Tangle Up in Blue, that whole record, bl- Blood on the Tracks, Simple Twist of Fate, and You're a Big Girl Now, and Idiot Wind, and 
and Lily Rose, Mary and Jack of Hearts, uh, Shelter from the Storm. That was a, I remember hearing that uh, when that record first came out, I guess that's 75. I was sitting in the back of a friend's car and it was on the radio. And I was just sitting back there, possibly in an altered state. And uh, uh, I just, those words just rolled off. I was like, God, that's amazing. Just beautiful lyrics. And, and I had to, it was like, you have to get me to a record store immediately. I, uh, this, I, have you done Twist the Fate oh, with yeah. any of bands? Yeah. I, I definitely think in those days, the songs definitely had more powerful meanings than some of the, I think well, the newer songs that come out today, I mean, like, talk well, there about. Was like no, there was no visual. It was, you listen to the songs. But I think that people really had something to say. I mean, you know, I mean, there's all this stuff going on in the world today, and no one's really saying anything, and yet Dylan said some very powerful things and is still saying powerful things to this day. You know, and yeah, I think Tangled Up in Blue is also just a, it's just, that's also just it's a, a great movie, American. that song. Yeah. It's, you know, same thing with Simple Twist of Fate. In like, you know, four or five minutes, it's a whole movie, you know. He just, there's not a wasted word in that. He sets the story and the, you know, and months later and there, it's amazing. So. When, when, when you're playing songs like sort of like Terrapin Station, which are really, really, really long songs, do you feel that there's a story to that as well? Oh, yeah. Well, there is, you know. There is. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not but, sure but, what it means, but there is a story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know uh, I forgot who it was, but, you know, uh, Thunderstruck is a song by ACDC, and it's got that whole, you know, this whole b intense guitar thing. And I remember, I forgot the guy from ACDC who said it. He goes, he goes yeah, everybody loves it, but you don't, you're the one who has to play it every night. <laughs> it's really tough. Do you ever feel like there's just some songs that are just like, you know, you love them, but they're just too burdensome to have to – actually play or do or they're just too complicated or somehow in a live setting they just don't come out the way you do if you were just sitting here in a studio and just under different conditions or anything like that well no i kind of like the ones that are uh, challenging you know we just started doing uh the band had done it before i'd never played it before it was uh king solomon's marbles the yeah. jazzy instrumental from blues for Alla. and uh it's in real fast seven seven eight time and um, I never played it before, so I learned it, and it's, it's a challenge to play it. But I look, you know, like, okay, right, bring it on. I'm kind of like that. Uh, I'm you, like that when I'm on stage, not in real life, though. I'm like, I'm kind of like, no, no, no. Well, you know, <laughs> we, all, we all have our places where yeah. we, we take it on. You know, <laughs> where, where did you learn to play the guitar? Oh uh, well, I I messed around with it, you know, learned a few basic chords, and then uh, when I was about 14, uh, I moved from Astoria out to Merrick which is what about 20 miles or something but it, it it might as well move to Alaska <laughs> it was such culture shock from growing up in Astoria so, uh, and I was kind of shy so I didn't really gather any friends for the first year I was there so uh, I started taking guitar lessons and really pra like practicing like two hours a day uh, for, for a year or two uh, so I made some pretty great strides in uh in, in the first couple of years, and then I was completely hooked. And I was taking jazz guitar lessons, but I was playing rock and roll, you know, r jamming with people and starting bands and that kind of thing. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about the, the 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 instruments. I know that Jerry Garcia played Doug Doug or, uh, Doug Owen guitars. Yeah, and I remember the two famous guitars he had was Tiger and Wolf and. When Jerry and Rosebud. And, and Rosebud. Rosebud. And I know that when Jerry passed away, there was actually like mm. a dispute legally um, on who was going to get who, it. Who owned them. Right, because Jerry like willed them back to Doug, Doug or something yeah. like that. And Doug couldn't even pay the inheritance tax <laughs> on it. <laughs> you know. Made for great court TV. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What, 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 what instruments did you play? I, I don't know anything about it, but what do you do to get the great sound that you get? Well, you know, I was never really uh, – until I joined Dark Star Orchestra, I was never really charged with trying to get the exact tones that Garcia did. You know, I was I was content to get sounds that I was happy with. You know, were really more reflected my taste. But it's really the appropriate thing for Dark Star. So I had uh, a great guy in St. Louis named um, Doug Sarno, Brad Sarno. Excuse me, Brad Sarno. I don't know where Doug came from. Uh, you think of the other guy, yeah, yeah the, I, Doug I, Irwin, right? Yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah. So anyway, Brad uh, helped me out. He got me started. He's a great with electronics. Knows everything about Jerry's guitars. And uh, we bought a Strat, and he ripped it apart and rewired it, and 
just and put in new pickups and did everything to make it like uh, Garcia's guitar. And then I said, okay, yeah, I liked it. I said, let's let's do another one even better. So this is kind of a real Frankenstein thing where you buy a neck from these this company and buy a body from and have it painted a certain way, and then it's got all that wiring in. Plus, it's got the it's got the uh, MIDI capability, which is to be able to play synthesizer with it built right into the guitar, so I can plug right into a brain of a synthesizer and, and play like flutes and wow. all that stuff. Uh, That's for the late '80s stuff. Late '80s and '90s, okay. yeah. How, when you're on the road, how many actual guitars do you actually have to take on the road with you? I have. Uh, right now, I just have uh, three. I just have those two guitars and an acoustic guitar. But I have room to grow. Okay. I, I, just <laughs> this, I just bought this gigantic road case that can hold five guitars and cases in it. Yeah. I, I know in a recent interview, Slash on Rockline said that he he's so hard on his equipment that he actually takes certain equipment on the road because <laughs> he knows it's going to get brutalized, and then he has other stuff just to s- sort of you know, create music. Do you have anything like that? Or no, no, I you know, your gear I don't, is your I don't gear. brutalize. I mean, you know, it gets a good workout, but I'm not. I'm not smashing it up, <laughs> like Pete Townsend or anything. I try to take good care of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the strings take more of a beating anyway. <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about social media for a moment. There's darkstarorchestra.net. There's jeffmadsen.info. There's Donna Jean Gottschaw Band. And by the way, let me spell that out. It's Donna, G-E-A-N, G-O-D-C-H-A-U-X, band.com, and zentricksters.com. You guys are just get the whole so And you also, you're also on MySpace. Uh, yeah, in fact, Facebook. Yeah, and, Facebook. Yeah, I, I believe you have eighty five thousand fans on Facebook right now, or something, something pretty no, big. No, I don't think. Yeah, so. I think so. Oh, yeah. Dark Star. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's possible. Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> no, two hundred. <laughs> <laughs> do, do do you do a lot of the social media, or do you? You know, I. I or is it hard? I'm, I mean, you I'm blog a little bit. I'm still old school. I don't even take a computer with me on the road, which is like unheard of at this this point. And I, I kind of like to get away from it. Uh, but when I come home, I keep an eye on it. You know, I check it out. I just look at it every day, see what's going on. That's about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a Twitter, a tweeter, Twitterer. Well, but obviously somebody's doing all the 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 because so, you guys. Yeah, I have. You know, there's some, yeah. Probably Randy ran. does a lot of stuff. Ah, there you go. Cause, we cause, have a guy, you know, David O'Reilly, who, who works on our uh, website, the Donna Jean, and the uh, and my personal website. You know, who's a computer whiz. He does all the heavy lifting there. You know, he whenever information comes in, we'll send it to him. And yeah, because you guys have you have photos, you have videos, you have yeah, music, yeah, you built have that whole thing for I mean, us. You have, you have impressive stuff. I mean, you really do. Um, I know that you have like the free download of the day or or, or whatever that is. Because I actually downloaded something the other day. It was it was really cool. You have really the good Dark stuff. Star has that on the website. Yeah, yeah, oh. it's really really cool. That's pretty cool. No, it's really really cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you the website I after the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have we have computer. <laughs> <laughs> we got a computer here. <laughs> you know, I want to hear some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. it's 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 rocking. <laughs> All right, for 2012, you'll be playing in New York at let's see in Hop Hog on January 12th. Yeah, that's now that's Manson and Baracco. That's me and Rob Baracco, who's the keyboard player for Dark Star. I was the keyboard player in the Zen Tricksters for a long, long time. And uh, and <laughs> probably one of my best buddies. Not probably, he is one of my best buddies. <laughs> and uh, in this case, we're going to be playing acoustic duo, which is uh, me playing acoustic guitar and him playing bass. You know, he's the keyboard player. Everybody knows him as keyboard player with Phil and Friends and the Dead and and. and Dark Star Orchestra and the Zentrixers, but he's an amazing bass player. He even did a tour in between uh, when they had R- with Rat Dog between they had when they had uh, Rob Wasserman and um, Robin Sylvester. They didn't have anybody, and and Weir says to Rob, "I hear you you play some good bass." And he says, "Would you do go out on a tour and play bass with me?" And he says, well, "I'd love to, but I don't own a bass." So, <laughs> so Bobby goes and gets a modulus bass for him for free from Modulus. He's got this great bass now. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, his his vocals are amazing with Dark Star. He, he the versatility. Yeah, yeah, I because mean, he, he plays. He's our pig pen guy. He's our Brent guy. He's our Bruce Hornsby guy. Our Vince Wellman guy. And oh, he's, he's got show guy. You know, yeah. doesn't he do a little? That's a lot of shoes to fill. Background vocals too. Yeah, 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 I noticed that too. That is a lot of shit. And he to sounds fill. exactly like 
pig pen, I think. And yeah, he does very really much, very much like Brent. He's really worked at that. Uh, you know, that's only something that he started to to do in recent years too. And when he joined uh, Dark Star, he, he wasn't even tremendously familiar with Brent's work. He he was more uh, from the seventies <coughs> uh, era, and uh, they said, "Well, that's part of the job." And he does a great. Uh, Brent Midland in impersonation, uh, if you want to call it impersonation, uh, tribute. Okay, I like tribute. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it gives you guys a lot more versatility in what but you can the, play. But this Manson Morocco thing, we, we did a couple of, sh we did about three shows last year, and the whole idea was to, was it's kind of like the Seinfeld where it's like a show about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a repertoire, we're not rehearsing. And it, and then in this case, it was Barack, Barack on bass and Jason Crosby on keyboards and uh, Joe Choco, who also plays in Donna Jean Band uh, on drums, and uh, and me on guitar. And we just went there. We don't, we don't know what we're gonna play, you know. And and uh, the example I I put on the CD sure. it was a perfect example of this. I was driving around and I heard I heard "Locomotive Breath" by Jethro Tull on the radio, and I was just thinking, I said. You know that would be kind of cool if we slowed it down and made it like a Muddy Waters tune, like a uh, like a Manish Boy kind of a feel. So sure enough, at the gig, I just d before right before we play, I say, "Let's try this," and no, we never rehearsed it. You know, everybody grew up listening to it, so they're kind of familiar with the song. And it's Baracko singing. I, I I printed out the words before I went there because I knew that would probably be a, uh, an issue. You know, because you haven't really form the song you know you might know you can sing along with it but <laughs> slap the lyrics in front of him i said you're gonna sing this and we do this version really different version of, of locomotive breath uh it's about 10 minutes 10 on minutes there. and 41 seconds <laughs> and uh i listened to it the other day and i was like yeah, it came out really good it's the only time i've ever played it in my life and uh it's completely spontaneous uh even goes off on a little flight of fancy near the end, like where we just lose the song for a while, and get jazzy, and then it comes back to it. And I was like, that's what I want that to be about. So that's what the, I, I guess the acoustic thing will be like that, and that maybe is, I don't know, so I'm not saying anything. It's, 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 it's all a improv. show about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so uh, we're going to play a little locomotive bright r breath right now, and uh, we'll be right back. Uh, after the song. So keep it here. Keep it locked in at 88.1 FM. Richard Solomon taking care of business with my special co-host, uh, Jeffrey Maisel, and my very special guest, uh, Jeff Matson. We'll be right back. Yeah. 
You are listening to Taking Care of Business on 88.1 WCWP, WCWP.org, and TCBRadio.com. Check out our all-star comedy show to benefit WCWP Radio. Featuring the best comics from Long Island and all around the country. Join us at Governor's Comedy Club in Levittown on Thursday, February 23rd at 8 p.m. Go to WCWP.org and click on Governor's Comedy to buy tickets. Tickets must be purchased in advance. All proceeds benefit WCWP Radio. WCWP's all-star comedy show at Governor's Comedy Club. Brought to you by 88.1 FM and WCWP.org. Sharper Training Solutions presents Computer First Grade for Grown-Ups, a hands-on workshop demonstrating basic computer word processing and editing skills for adults. Designed for those who have taken computer kindergarten or have equivalent computer knowledge, this class will be held on Wednesday, February 15th at 2 p.m. at the Plainview Old Bethpage Public Library. Registration begins on Monday, January 16th. For more information, call 516-938-0077. The community calendar is a public service from your friends at 88.1 FM and WCWP. Org. What I really need Some kind of affection Instead of do 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 It's doom boom 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 Oh that's cool In the shuffle Well Jethro Tull closes his show with that so and you just had like this in the middle Kind oh, yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, this is kind of cool. All right, cool. All right, so let's go back. All right, some, some very classic songs. I see, we have some great music here, so I'll continue with the music here. And we'll go back to the show dates, but this is a show about confusion. <laughs> so we never have show a format. <laughs> we have, we mm-hmm. never have, I mean, we have notes, but uh, they don't count. We're jamming here. Exactly. Right? I do yeah. the improv thing, too. Uh, usually we call that unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, I happen to love both China Cat, Sunflower, and I Know You, Ryder. I mean, I, yeah, I that's it, obviously a the yeah. same performance. Uh, join those two together yeah. when you play. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna. I'll definitely. We'll play that. In fact, we'll play that right now, and then we'll come back. But um, so we'll take a little break here. We'll play that. <laughs>
China Cat Sunflower. I, I, you know, I love that uh, song, and that's got to be one of the, the true classics. And I know you, Ryder. Um, in fact, when you sing, I know you, Ryder. Um, it, I definitely. That's, that's probably one of the most passionate songs I see you actually sing, especially when you, you sing the part about you know I wish I could be a headlight on a northbound train. You know, when you sing that, it just I kind of gives me a little goosebumps. So yeah. you know, you, you do a lot of passion with that. So, so like I said, if you ever need anybody to. To, to sing along. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what goes through your mind with some of these songs? You know, these are, they're, they're, they're like, they're, they're really different. I mean, they're folky and they're kind of bluegrassy. Well, you know, there you have it, like a juxtaposition right there. You have China Cat, Sunflower, which is a complete psychedelia bit that, that you know, Hunter uh, wrote, I think in like one afternoon he wrote China Cat alligator and dark star or something like that you know the one of those kind of afternoons yeah. <laughs> and and the lyrics are, are you know children uh, should not try that at home. <laughs> yeah. um you know uh, um you know classic 60s psychedelia you know the lyrics are just impressionistic uh music is is a perfect example of grateful dead music where where uh Everybody's got these different parts. It's not like someone just strumming chords and so, 
everybody's playing these inter intertwining parts that one of the things that attracted to me that right away uh, I, you know it says a lot about Bob Weir's rhythm guitar playing too instead of just as I said just strumming away on chords he's always playing interesting little lines uh, that complement the melodies of the lead guitar and the melodies of Phil Esch's bass uh, and then you have that and then it rolls into I Know You're Rider which is a complete uh, traditional folk song that uh, you know they 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 arranged early on. I mean, his versions of that go back to '66. Uh, so I'm sure it. it and those songs always went together with the Grateful Dead. No, they didn't. They oh, weren't they? originally. They originally were together. Were. Uh, know Your Rider was a standalone song originally, uh, uh, and China Cat uh, first. That was on their first album, wasn't it? Ch well, I know you. No, China Cat was. I, I, I know your writers on the first. No, that's on the th on the third on uh, Axelmax uh, China Cat. Oh, that's right. Um, but they, uh, you know, quickly could see that they, you know, uh, they were jamming out. I guess one day after China Cat and said, "Well, we could just drop right into I know your writer here. It just works so beautifully. <laughs> it it does." Uh, Did you ever get a chance to ask Robert Hunter about all these women he wrote about? There was. Althea and Cassidy and <laughs> Queen Jane and <laughs> well, well, no. Bertha. Queen wrote Jane wrote. <laughs> uh, Queen Jane is Dylan. Oh, Queen Jane, that's right, that's right. And but Cassidy is is Barlow. So, <laughs> but, but, uh, but there's all but these women. The one, yeah, the one yeah. that's Bertha. There's a, yeah. the one that's actually about a fan, a, a, an actual fan that was in the wall at their uh, their their oh. clubhouse studio. Oh, like and a, box it, fan. a Bertha <laughs> fan. It was called. It was. It said Bertha on it. Mm -hmm. And it was coming coming loose, and it was coming out of the window, and they were like, "I had to move." Bertha, don't you come around? They were afraid it was. Oh, that's gonna. hilarious! <laughs> <laughs> I just learned something new. There you go. See that this is why we do what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and Scarlet Begonias, uh, that was written about when he met when Hunter met his wife. Did not know uh, that either. Wow, uh, you know he met her in, in English. She's English, and you know I was walking down Grover in a square Grover. and around Grover. Oh, wow. it's a, you know. It just caught the eye of this girl. It's a really nice story when you when you when you hear it from that point of view. And they're still together years and years and years later. Wow. Well, well, where is Franklin's Tower? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, I always thought maybe it was it was the uh, like a, a metaphor for uh, uh, Independence Hall or something like that. Like ben well, that but that's the beauty Taylor. of these songs. Y you can listen to one line and think it goes one way, and then you listen to another line. It goes another way. Yeah, and, and that's the way he would have it. And, and, and it Hunter was never w one w that, you know, for the most case, wanted to uh, explain what, what he was shooting for because he, he likes there's – there's actually a scientific word that I'll never think of now. Um, we, have the, we have Google. My, <laughs> my brother would know it where, uh, you know, for, for the uh, different interpretations people get from sometimes even hearing the words wrong. But they come up with this whole interpretation of the song, and Hunter loves that. He just thinks that's wonderful. Well, I read the words to China Cat a few years ago because yeah. I've been singing along for 30 years, and then I saw the words, and it was nothing like <laughs> I <laughs> thought. You and, uh, no, nothing. It's and, like that commercial and the words make no sense. <laughs> for Rocket Man yeah. burning out his Ro ears <laughs> of ear alone. It's the well, Queen <laughs> of Chinese. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, like the famous, the famous misquote is, by you know Hendrix, instead of ex excuse me while I kiss the sky, it's excuse me while I kiss this guy. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> well, there's a bathroom on the right. <laughs> there's a bathroom on the right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just see what else I wanted to cover. Let's let's talk just yes. Yeah, so you have um, some other music that we didn't cover. I think there was Warm Heart. Yeah, that now that's a, a studio recording of the Zen Tricksters. Uh, and, and what I like to think is our uh, one of the high points of the band. And that's when Rob Barocco is on keys, uh, of course, m me on guitar, R Cliff Black on bass, and Joe Charco on drums. Just a, a four piece, and uh, we had a real strong band then. And that was from an album called Love Surreal. I think it was recorded in ninety seven, ninety seven or ninety eight, and um, that's a. Uh, a uh, original song that I wrote with uh, a, a woman named Jennifer Marcard, and we jam in the studio there. Uh, it goes on for a while too. There's another ten-minute song there, and uh, what's significant about that is uh, Phil Esch was given a copy of our CD 
and he didn't know that we were uh, that we knew the Grateful Dead the way. And he was impressed. He heard that stuff and was impressed by the by our, our ability to jam in the studio. He claimed, and he told me this personally, that the dead were never capable of doing that, which I would dispute with him. There's some great <laughs> studio jams on some of the records. but uh, And then he called uh, uh, Rob Barocco and I to play with Phil and Friends. And that's how that all got started because he heard our, you know, most people would just assume it was because we knew how to, play Grateful Dead music, but I think, he, uh, to be honest with you, was, he was a little appalled at how well we knew the great because <laughs> they weren't really going for that at the time. You know, they weren't trying to replace, they didn't want another Garcia, you know, they wanted to go in different directions, you know, so I think he found that a little unnerving that, you know, because this was only 1999, you know, it was only four years after Jerry, Jerry passed, passed away. Now, obviously, they, they've gone strongly in that direction with, with John Kazlicek, you know, further, who was incidentally the guy I replaced in Dark Star Orchestra. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I, I know that Fish did on I think Jerry Garcia's third anniversary of his death, or as we say in the world of Judaism, his yurt site. Um, I think they did. Uh, was it Terrapin, the, Terrapin Station? Yeah. I think. Yeah, and I, that that was actually pretty moving too to, to see them do that. Um, what do you see yourself doing over the next five years or so, especially when you're going to come back on the show and tell us about that in the future? <laughs> <laughs> but what, what do you what, what do you hope what, what do you hope to, to do that's a little you know you know I mean obviously you're going to be touring all these other things, but do you have any project brewing? You know? Yeah, well, I'd like to. Uh, I'd really like to see. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, Dark Star is going to keep on going the way it's going. I'd like to keep working on the original stuff. It's just for our own head. And like I say, maybe put have a little CD to put on the on the merch table, and but I and, and I'd really like to record a, an album with uh, Donna Jean. We have we have a bunch of material that hasn't been recorded, and uh, we're talking about it. We're you know just about finding time for it, but. If you ever uh, need a place to debut it, you know, I, I know a guy. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy great. to volunteer. You know. Yeah. Is the music <coughs> proprietary to each band, or can? Uh, well, can, yeah, I mean, can, you're, you're, yeah. Can Dark Star play as in Trickster original? You know, if you know they could, way? but, um, I, I, you know, since we don't really play a lot of originals, uh, uh, I think we're going to stick with the ones that we're writing. At the f you know, once in a while we play the Run Mary that we played before. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for the most part, people just want to hear us play Grateful Dead. Well, no, no, I'm one. saying uh, if you're playing original materials, yeah. you, the Donna stuff stays with Donna and... Yeah, for the most the part. I mean, you know, uh, I don't. There's no hard and fast rules about yeah. that. But you know, if you're working on stuff with people, and try to. I know Donna and the Tricksters had a CD. Yeah, also. we did a we did a CD. Um, there's some great original material in there. Yeah, yeah, that was that was an all original. Uh, actually, there was uh, one one. Well, let's hardly call it a cover. It was from a re-recording of a song that was on the Keith and Donna album made back in '75. A song called Farewell Jack. And then we, we did a single. We did a, an arrangement of uh, Till the Morning Comes uh, with Donna Jean and the Tricksters. I'll bring that next time. So this has been Richard Solomon, Jeffrey Mazel. Thank you to Jeff Matson, Randy My Matson, uh, for being on Taking Care of Business. Uh, we'll see you in a week. Car Talk is next. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'm sure we're going to try to stick in a couple of songs uh, because I have great sound engineering people. So for now, we'll see you in a week. And thanks for listening. And you can always check out our other rock shows at tcbradiorocks.podbean.com. We'll see you soon. And thanks for listening.
Career opportunities in accounting are growing with entry-level accountants earning around $50,000 in their first year. Join the LIU Post School of Professional Accountancy for our open house on Saturday, February 4th to learn about our bachelor's, master's, and accelerated degree programs. Meet our faculty and representatives from admissions, financial assistance, career services, and academic counseling. Whether you're considering LIU Post as a freshman, transfer, or grad student, this open house is for you. For more information and to register, call 516-299-2900. LIU Post. Find out how good you really are. This is WCWP, Brookville, New York, LIU Post Public Radio. Hear us at 88.1 FM and WCWP.org.